Can I have attention? Please. Please. We talk about care and safety. Can we put that into practice also now? Or should I talk about chickpeas again? Thank you. Gwen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, bonjour à toutes et tous. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Um, my name is Gwendolyn Sharp. I'm the founder of an organization called The Green Room. And uh, today I'm actually going a bit out of my uh, personal zone of comfort because I usually work, uh, I would say, 95% of the time uh, with the music sector. Um, dealing with uh, environmental sustainability, but also, uh, as we will talk about today, uh, all uh, aspects of uh, sustainability, and especially uh, social sustainability. Uh, so thank you uh, for, to the team of uh, Circo Strada for this uh, opportunity. Um, so today, uh, as uh, I think you, you got from the, from the wonderful introductions that we had, uh, we are talking about sustainability and especially uh, now uh, focusing on cooperation as a lever uh, to navigate uh, the complexities of what a sustainable world uh, could be and maybe should be. Um, of course, uh, we've had since COVID uh, and in the recent years quite a lot of talks around environmental sustainability, which is maybe what comes to mind first when you talk about sustainability. And by the way, we are now uh, during the uh, so-called uh, sust um, um, Sustainable Development uh, Week, which lasts uh, uh, until the end of uh, this week, until September 26. And that's also very linked to the SDGs, so the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals that give this framework of the urgent work that we have to do uh, as a society and, of course, which uh, concerns also the, the cultural sectors. So this framework is quite used. We are not specifically going to refer to it uh, today, but we are really uh, going to talk about sustainability in this more um, holistic uh, way with our uh, different uh, speakers today, uh, which I'm really happy to welcome. Uh, they will uh, introduce themselves and especially also their context you will see we have uh, a very broad range of uh, uh, experiences and uh, practices. So I think this is going to be a very uh, interesting conversation. Uh, we are together for an hour and a half and we'll try to keep 15 minutes also at the end for questions. Um, so if you have anything uh, that comes to your mind, don't hesitate to write it down or to keep it for, for, for the end. Um, and as a warm-up, let's say we will, because it's a bit cold also, but uh, uh, to, to start, uh, I'm going to address each of you um, with the first question and also if you can take this opportunity um, to, to introduce yourself, your work, and as I said, maybe contextualize it. And um, so Yoris, my first question, first question was for you <laughs> first. Maybe to help us uh, from, you, you stand as a researcher, and maybe to help us also to have a kind of a state of the art of where we stand when we talk about uh, cooperation and sustainability, and to give us also maybe what are the issues uh, that we are dealing with. Okay, thank you. So indeed, um, my name is Joris. I work as a researcher. I work for uh, IDEA Consult. Uh, on many different kinds of projects, also together with uh, Circo Strada on the Perform Europe project, uh, which you might have heard about and you will hear about uh, it later because a new call is coming up. We are the research partner together with uh, Circo Strada and other networks in there. Uh, it's a project about sustainability in international touring in circus and other performing arts. So sustainability is an aspect there, but uh, we also do uh, other kinds of uh, studies uh, on other kinds of levels. Uh, for instance, recently we finished also a study for the Ministry of Culture in Flanders, um, together also with the Circus Centrum, about sustainable career development of uh, circus artists. So sustainability in these kinds of researches is uh, a topic that's recurring. And indeed, it's uh, a 
about environmental aspects, but also about uh, the social, economic, uh, personal, and artistic and cultural aspects. And what we always try to do in these researches is uh, indeed try to understand what are the stress points, what are the issues, uh, what's the pressure on our practice, but also have a good look at the strategies that people in the sector, also outside of the sector, are developing together these uh, modes of cooperation, try to create more sustainable conditions. And as an entry, I would like to briefly break down these two elements. Um, first, unpack a bit uh, the complexity of the issues that we are dealing with uh, on the one hand, and then later on I will, uh, yeah, I thought about let's say, a breakdown of five types of models of uh, collaboration, five collaborative strategies that we can use also to tackle these issues. Uh, but first, briefly, what are these issues? Uh, I'm going to try to keep it uh, as short as possible, but, possible, but you know, it's very complicated. But I think a good entry point is uh, economy, uh, economic situation in broader society, but also the economy of our sector, circus arts, broader life arts, how it is evolving and also uh, the economic position of people working in that sector. And maybe just to quote a few figures from the, the study we did for the Ministry of Culture. We did a survey with uh, circus artists in Flanders being well aware that Flanders is also kind of like a privileged uh, situation because we have a, a quite interesting circus policy. But also in Flanders we see, for instance, that uh, one out of four artists has fixed employment. Only one out of four, so three out of four are working on project based. Other statistic is that uh, uh, half of the artists make their work with no funding or co-production whatsoever. So it's really uh, from the touring that the income is there or from other uh, sources of income. We also see that three out of four of the artists do have multiple jobs. So they work as a circus artist, but they only also do uh, work job outside of the artistic practice in the sector or out of, outside of the sector. Also, we see that uh, four out of five has an international practice. So what you see there, it's really uh, uh, all symptoms of the difficult uh, socio-economic situation of uh, artists in our sector, also arts workers in our sector. I think it's uh, safe also to expand that to people working with the artists in organizations. Also there you see a shift towards yeah, less fixed employment, more project-based, and I think that is really the basis, this economic situation of uh, a lot of uh, pressures on the people and uh, that's also something that came out of this survey the impact that this has on people working in the sector we saw on average a career of an artist uh, responding to the survey it lasts 10 years uh, many people are considering to drop out because the pressure is so high mental pressure emotional pressure risk of injuries we talked about that yesterday lack of artistic recognition that is felt, less of time to exchange with the peers. So there are a lot of pressures and yeah, people are dropping out or considering to stay working uh, on, on the condition that these situations can change. So I think this economic situation, the impact it has on people, on the social relations that we can develop uh, by being active in the sector, that's uh, really a huge topic and it relates of course to the environmental aspects because we need to travel internationally we need to produce in order to survive and this has an environmental impact and we saw in our study that it's really a challenge a struggle and i think it was also summarized by uh, by the statement uh, by eric lenoir the title yes how can you uh, be one with your ecosystem and at the same time gagne uh, sacrut, as it was said. So this is really a, a fundamental paradox. Um, so that's uh, a bit the complexity of the, all these issues, uh, but there's also good news, uh, especially in the circus sector, we see that there is a lot of engagement, uh, strong community feeling, as we also saw in the artistic intervention this morning, a lot of imagination and people addressing these issues in the work themselves. So these are our strengths, and we saw so that uh, people are deploying these strengths by working together and trying to change things. And uh, try to keep briefly as possible five strategies uh, to create more sustainable situation. I think we heard them all yesterday also in the, in the panel about uh, about safety, uh, talks about care. 
First is um, create capacity for professional support of artists. This is really essential. Uh, we used to have it more when we were still in the situation when everybody was part of a company. There was more kind of like this collective environment, but now we have a lot of uh, freelancers and yeah, it always comes up in our, uh, in our research. We need more capacity for support that we need to, uh, as artists, we, we cannot do everything together. We need uh, knowledge, contacts, etc. Some people have structural support, but only a minority. Uh, some people can work with producers, but a lot can, so professional support is uh, one form of collaboration. The second one is um, sharing resources uh, within our community, among the peers. This was mentioned specifically yesterday also with regards to uh, risk management, huh? uh, sharing knowledge of how to approach these things, uh, but also sharing our context, who knows who, who knows what, sharing infrastructure, is also part of that, um, sharing this capacity for pro professional support and uh, yeah, also yeah, sharing money, resources. In Flanders, there's an interesting experiment, oh no, in Brussels, uh, an interesting experiment. It's called the Common Wallet and it's uh, artists uh, forming a community and they only have one bank account. So they share not only their incomes from, from their work, uh, they have one bank account and uh, a few principles. So you take money when you need it, and it's up to you to decide when you need it. So there are a lot of experiments also with these kinds of uh, sharing of resources, and I think that's uh, also a challenge for you as a sector. Uh, I know that there is a strong community feeling in the circus sector, but how to translate this in concretely modes of practice of sharing. So this is, uh, I think, a chantier to be explored. So sharing resources among artists and peers and arts workers is the second thing. The third thing, a uh, huge topic also is uh, to create more sustainable partnerships in the ecosystem between artists and companies, but also with pres uh, presenting organizations, the residencies, the different types of actors in the ecosystem. And there's, it's a challenge that the work has become more and more project-based and uh, relations are also more project-based. But also you think, I, uh, I see uh, that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, trials to create long-term engagements again uh, between producing houses and venues, the residencies for trying to follow the trajectories of artists and not just uh, supporting a production. So there is uh, a lot of uh, energy there and it's good and it should be further developed. Um, so this is within the ecosystem. Uh, fourth strategy is connections outside of the ecosystem, uh, not only within the circus field but also uh, with partners outside of the uh, circus field, with uh, educational partners, with research, well-being, community. Yesterday, uh, most of you were there in the Petit, uh, Plus Petit Cirque du Monde. That is a very good example, I think, uh, of how you can create a sustainable situation in one space. Um, it's a different model of practicing circus than the international touring model. So it's both connecting with the communities, it's environmental friendly. So these kinds of... Um, uh, we see that a lot of artists also uh, are stepping out of the touring model and trying to engage with these kind of practices as an answer also to, uh, to these issues. So that's the fourth uh, model or strategy. And the fifth one is uh, engaging in the dialogue with, uh, with the policy makers. Uh, the, the analysis is also that our funding systems are in a way pushing us towards unsustainable practices. So we need to take them along and also I think yesterday the story explanation behind the Plus Petit Cirque du Monde. It's a very good example of how they managed to uh, enter into a dialogue with uh, the local policy makers on the different levels, basically, also by listening. What are the policies? What are the goals of the policies? And so, yeah, in a nutshell, as short as possible, Gwen, uh, <laughs> untangling of the issues and already uh, a number of uh, possible strategies. Thank you, Joris. That was very clear and we'll come back, of course, to some of those points, especially the last one also that we, we will address. Um, uh, Jean, I, I wanted also, uh, so uh, Joris referred to this uh, um, economical aspect of sustainability and uh, relating to the, to the models for, for artists. Uh, and I know that you've worked uh, more specifically on the theme of uh, um, sustainable careers uh, of artists and with a study that uh, was called uh, Next Mobility. 
Uh, can you maybe elaborate on that and also, of course, present your work and, uh, and your own uh, context? Yes. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Jin. I'm from South Korea. I'm an independent producer, work with um, different um, artists and festivals in South Korea and also try to have more international connections through the festivals and also working by, by working with the creative entities like uh, artist companies. Um, um, well, I think I can start my story from pandemic. During pandemic, after a few months is that few months of realizing that, okay, we cannot travel, we cannot meet each other, we, can, we cannot do anything. I had a Zoom meeting with um, other international friends, mostly producers, and we were talking about like, hey, how are you? Are you okay? Are you surviving? Like, how is your industry? How is your country? And we got this idea of, I mean, like, we thought of this word that, oh, uh, I think I'm not a producer anymore. I feel like I'm an unproducer, which is unproducing unpro like everything. We don't really produce anything at the moment. And we really like this idea of unproducing because it helped me, uh, us uh, to think about what is the producing and why we need to do that. Why, what was the reason we have been doing this producing for many, many years? And at the moment, um, we were kind of, uh, we were able to think of a uh, pure, genuine reason why we'd like to do it in the future. And it helped us to go to the um, research project, um, two different research projects that I was able to initiate. One uh, was on producing workshop for the producers and the artists, so that I give, a quest I give a questions to the artists and producers, what is the reason that you'd like to do art in, in now and the future. And um, this is like a conversation of um, finding a different reasons in the sentences to introduce yourself for the future um, careers. And um, I think I was able to survive because of this workshop that I was able to initiate it. And um, yeah, also, yeah, we have a good music here. <laughs> And also, on the other side, uh, with other two producers, uh, we were... Yes, I really like it. <laughs> we we um, did this research called um, New Connections and Next Mobility, which is all about the international exchanges in the post-pandemic era. Because that was... That started because I miss my friends and I want to meet my friends in the future, but just in different countries, different cities. I don't want to be isolated. I don't want to like say no to everybody. Okay, I'm not going to see you anymore, but I want to meet them. I want to work with them. I want to keep doing what I've been doing. So this uh, next mobility research was actually all about the new type of international collaboration with the different tools and different methodologies after the uh, development of the technology. We're not really presenting the full size of production to the different cities, but maybe we can choose, um, like we say, conceptualing um, or um, deep mobility, which is like not only bringing the shows to one city and coming back, but try to have more cultural context and also try to understand and try to stay a few more days to have like something like a workshop or the residency so that we can make this mobility itself more deeper. And also, we, we can also say this in a slow touring, not like a fast tons of presenting the shows, but try to have more slow touring in a way that we can leverage the, the uh, compensation of um, international tourings. And um, we also, touched a bit about the green mobility with the different tools that we can um, um, use for our future international collaborations. And um, so in the first year of next mobility research, we had this idea of new different tools for helping us to be internationalized and keep ourselves working with different countries and cities. But interestingly, in a second year, what we were, uh, what we were focusing on was actually the reason why we need to um, be internationalized. And it gave us 
uh, the moment to broaden our perspective to the sector which is underrepresented, um, to the uh, part of the society we didn't really see before, so that we can talk about, um, we, we called it as a new narrative. Uh, for example, one artist as a researcher, she had this idea of uh, working with the immigrant community and refugee community in South Korea, and she thinks that it's really important international project. And also the other artist, uh, she had this idea of um, uh, interviewing different women uh, um, in Asia, which is uh, under the gender imbalance situation, so that she can collect those different uh, voices from the females in Asian society, so that she can uh, try to make a more um, um, solidarities with different narratives and different voices. So, um, for, as, as I told you, first year we were focusing on the tools and what we can do, what we can use, but the second year of the next mobility research, we were focusing on, okay, who's in the room? We were um, thinking about that as, I think it's also part of the sustainability, like sustainability in the manner of um, social and um, so, um, yeah, um, social aspects, social perspective. And um, yeah, I think that's all I can say <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. Oh, thank you, we'll come back also to the, to, to the narratives and the touring models there in, in, in just a moment with, uh, with Daniel. But to, uh, before that also we had a, a, a good, uh, I would say, entry point uh, to the Sphere project and to this uh, uh, connection to the non-human uh, early on with uh, Andrea and, uh, and Maria. Uh, so uh, I would like all uh, uh, to ask you now uh, to maybe uh, explain a bit about the, the Sphere project and also talk about how uh, you work also with the, these aspects and uh, especially um, the, um, uh, the technological uh, also aspect of, the, of your work. All right. Um, I think um, if it's possible to use some slides, it would help me lot just to get uh, get going but yeah I'm uh, Ulle Strandberg Holling uh, and uh, I'm a director choreographer product manager and also something uh, as attractive as an administrator I think uh, I uh, will do a slightly scripted version because I try to like, crunch in so much details in six minutes right now so I, I, I will faint um, so I'm based in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, and my background is uh, as a circus performer, acrobat and juggler. Um, and uh, I'm particularly interested in the meeting between circus, technology, economy and organization. And if I've met some people of you pre-pandemic uh, networking, I was probably working as a project manager and director for Circo Circar, and uh, there my under trilogy has been touring a lot. So. Um, Maybe you've seen some of those performances. Right now, I also, if we go back uh, a few slides, uh, I can just say next, next or something, but it doesn't matter. This is my company nowadays, Salvarantan de Wilder. So it's me and Sara de Wilder. And uh, it's an artistic collaboration between us. Uh, we have a shared artistic leadership and are driven by developing alternative models for creative processes and performing arts production. So, um, we try to find new formats and contexts for our art, and we work locally, nationally, and internationally, uh, often in collaborative projects. So our, our experience with the circus has clearly shown the value of joint risk-taking, and it also permits our projects in other art forms, such as dance, visual art, and theater. just want to say that uh, I'm going to uh, say that we have started some weird projects, like the Crypto Circus Project at the Sphere, I will talk more about that. Uh, and then we also have our studio, the Fantastiska Platsen. So it's a couple of slides here. You can take next one and next one. And uh, it's just a space in central Stockholm where we have a lot of cross innovation, uh, fun gatherings, presenting performances and so on. Um, and me speaking about technology, right now we have developed also uh, uh, a large-scale uh, language model. We started one and a half years ago. It's specifically made for uh, performing arts. And I think it's called Educated Eater. And I think that this uh, also goes together with, with kind of uh, the idea of uh, uh, how we can encourage um, 
technological experimentations as a way to find new narratives and new ways of working. Um, this is uh, right now, if we go to the next slide, uh, Educated Eater. Uh, it has been fed with, with kind of my texts and my work from the last 10 years. And it's a way to find new and other narratives from our own documentation of our own projects. And it has landed into a, a, a new production that is called Tospot that we're, that we're, we're building uh, right now. Actually, it's called uh, uh, This is the Still Place presents Tomorrow Officially Sucks, But Today is the Best Tospot. But we just call it Tospot for the sake of simplicity. And the idea with this, with this uh, performance is basically that, that technology can help us re rewire how we see our own stories, our, our own narratives, and can make us just uh, look into our own practices and see new ways forward. Um, so it, it's not um, AI as some kind of dictatorship or anything like this. It's AI as a very non-scalable personal assistant, a large model trained on only 200 pages of raw text. Um, and it's been working amazingly well. If we go forward a little bit, we can jump, uh, that's the ensemble of that, and then we jump there, the sphere. So in 2017, uh, I started working with the idea of a parallel economy for the circus arts and the performing arts in general. And uh, this was, this came to me uh, when I started investigate what blockchain technology could be for circus. And we approached it a bit as an apparatus, as you would do as a circus performer. Uh, how can this blockchain thing, the crypto, the Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, how you want to refer to it, help, actually help us uh, not to kill our creative uh, creativity or just uh, create uh, like financiation of, uh, of everything we do? How can it actually be something that rewires a digital infrastructure? Um, so the Sphere in 2020 became a Creative Europe large-scale cooperation project. And you've seen also this Maria and Andrea that presented a bit of their works that are now creating, like Maria is creating a derivative work, some kind of next version of an already existing work. And we also tried to revive past works from 10 years ago or even longer ago. We've been invited people to, to try to revive works. And we tried to find ways of... Um, making a lot of people. We tried to have all the stakeholders in our ecosystem, like presenters, theaters, uh, uh, artists, technicians, uh, audience, everyone participate in co and co-decide co what, how can uh, the next iteration of a production that has existed take, uh, happen uh, through new artists. Uh, and then we tried to build that economical system for that, that capture different values, economical, financial values, but also other values. How can we like transform, transmit performances and create new performances um, using new technology? And as a, yeah, as a question that, that, um, um, that, I, that I, you first sent out to me, it was a, a question that basically was, um, um, how, how was it formally? It was quite interesting, I have to see. Uh, there's a strong need to deconstruct digital beliefs. So how would you, how did, does the sphere answer to that? And um, what, I, what I see or what I think is that the current uh, technological belief that we all have is that internet, social media, uh, the digital invisible infrastructure is comfortable. It's something that we can just rely on and something that just works for us and something that, that just encourages us to share stuff in Facebook groups or whatever. But it's actually feeding uh, a very um, strange business model that creates a genocide in Myanmar or that actually is um, really um, provoking or making um, weakening democracy. I would say. So we, how does the sphere answer to, to this? I mean, the sphere is 
an experiment on something parallel or something else, on another narrative, on another relation to internet, to, to the social media, uh, the invisible infrastructure. Because maybe if we rewire the infrastructure, the way that we socialize, because I would say also that social media today is actually socializing us in a way to act in the favor of the platform. So, uh, and we have to collect the data. People ask us to collect the data uh, uh, to show this is the statistics. This is how many that, that read my post. This is how many who saw my trailer. This is how many who bought book tickets through Instagram, etc. So we're stuck in that. So uh, we have a big, uh, very important uh, mission, I would say, to find ways to, of course, build your communities there if you want to, but what's your migration plan and what is the way that you can avoid that kind of data uh, trap? Um, because we, you have to work for what you want to do and not for what the platform wants you to do. And um, that, that, that's what, what Tosspot, uh, the pr production, the kind of AI that we built and also the Sphere is about. It's rewiring finding new narratives through using and daring to be inside of technology. So uh, this is my like <laughs> important note to bring. <laughs> Thank you, Ole. And uh, you, you mentioned like building the community and I think that's a very good uh, bridge uh, to go towards you, uh, Theo. Uh, you define yourself as a builder. Um, and uh, my question to you was, uh, um, Joris was mentioning this, uh, how important also, uh, or how we can have this strategy also of working maybe more with uh, other sectors than, than the performing arts sector. And how do you see, uh, for you, how can uh, artists, different stakeholders, organizations like yours or like your model also as a collective, how do you see that as, a, as an interesting uh, level also uh, seeing from the point of view of performing arts? Uh, so, uh, we're not working in the performing arts uh, sector. We uh, are architects, and we define ourselves as architects builders because we basically build everything that we design. So, if you can move on the next. So, we are more interested in two spaces than buildings. It means that we are not obviously building huge buildings. We are building small-scale interventions that uh, can make things happen in places. So we are more focusing on experiences than spaces. This is a former nightclub in Italy where we um, slightly renovated it so the community of the village can occupy this former nightclub to have some uh, weekly market, for example. So we move to places to places and also to the other slide. So um, we are focusing more on the processes than the results. So how can this experience of transforming a space that is usually painful, you know, and dusty and uh, the work of the craftsmen is not uh, such a uh, nice work usually, how do you transform this experience of making into something that can straighten the community uh, and to empower a, a local community to transform their own spaces. So we come somewhere, we gather the community, we co-design with them, and then we build it with them. So we, for example, this is a, a local association in Marseille city with the differently able people and we help them to transform their spaces, making furniture, a kitchen and so on. So it's very tangible uh, work, if you can move. So basically what we say is that architects should stop building new buildings. It's a resource consuming and they should just care about what is here. And what is here, it's not only spaces, uh, it's also resources. For example, we use a lot of reuse materials in what we do. We harvest our own uh, trees to cut them and to work with them. Uh, so resources, people, of course, as I said, this is um, furniture we made with the uh, asylum seekers in a place in the south of France to help them to develop their garden, for example. This is natural uh, paint technique coming somewhere from Sweden, maybe, I don't, I don't remember. 
Um, so I think our work is really more related to this notion of uh, care and experiences more than uh, building new buildings and uh, design uh, beautiful spaces. If you can move. So in the end, this is why we are building. It's an excuse to straighten communities so they can be proud of, the, of themselves when they do stuff that they usually don't. So making is at the heart of what we do. And this is also the crossroads between architecture, social work, and also art, which I think I will talk later on, but uh, we are also doing many things around the making processes, like making movie, uh, graphic design, edition processes, and everything. But this I will talk later, I guess. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was another slide. Um, Daniel, last, last but not least, um, we, when we prepared this uh, roundtable, I, I remember you mentioned um, talking about uh, leadership that was very important. And I was wondering, um, we talked about those small scale intervention, and obviously you work for CIRCA, so the, the question of the scale here is, uh, is really important. And how do you, uh, what kind of strategies, I would say, do you develop within CIRCA uh, to address this uh, question of leadership? And also, uh, how do you see that in cooperation also for programming uh, within, within the, the company and, uh, and the work that you are conducting? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, sorry about my accent in, in, in advance, but you've had a nice Australian over here translating for you. Um, I work for Circa. So Circa is quite a large-scale Australian circus based in Brisbane. Um, we travel internationally. We have uh, a big market here in Europe and that additionally UK, they're separate, um, as well as the Americas, Asia, um, definitely Australia and New Zealand. Um, I'm not going to claim to be an expert of any kind on sustainability, and I don't think Circa is either. So I'm going to represent myself in this conversation and just talk from experience because I think that's um, useful. Um, Circa has about 60 full-time employees equivalent. There are anywhere from, it sort of changes obviously, from 23 to 28 full-time acrobats who are on salary. So that is a commitment that Circa made to the art form and to artists that they have full-time employment with leave, sick leave, all of those things built in and they don't have to worry about their next gig. Um, as far as we know, we are the only Australian circus functioning like that, and I think we are still quite rare in the field, especially at the scale at which we work, um, which is, you know, quite impressive. Sadly, of course, that creates a massive financial burden before you've done anything. So every week we know that we've spent this much money before we've started the week. Um, so we have to tour notoriously. Um, we are lucky to receive a small percentage. It hovers around 20%. It, it, it changes, sometimes less, sometimes a few percent more, of support from the Australian government and its various funding arms. Um, but everything else is really income that we need to make, and that's from touring. Uh, we have a l relatively large-scale training facility in Brisbane, um, which focuses on very young uh, aspiring artists all the way to young professionals that are about to, you know, go into a circus like Circa. Um, we also have a Circability program which is focused on people with disability and how circus can bring um, new mobility and new ways of collaborating and thinking to their lives. Um, and that is also quite a unique program. Um, in terms of leadership and sustainability, I think this was in the context of a, you know, a pre-briefing conversation that we were having. And I said that, you know, really for us to collaborate and for us to, you know, make a move on sustainability, and that needs to be within the, in the realms of, of our industry. I mean, I don't think we're going to stop the ice caps melting. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, but I think that, you know, we can affect change and we can make a difference, and it has to be supported by leadership. I think, you know, I've just told you about circus structure. Every single, you know, artist, organisation, venue is going to have a different structure, and a, leaders need to make choices about what what changes they can make, where they can adapt, which is right for that structure. And I think it's also about humility of saying, you know, I don't know the right answer, but we're going to try this for a while. Okay, we were wrong. We need to do something else. Um, in terms of collaboration, uh, Circus got quite an interesting... Well, it's not that unique. There's a lot of other circuses doing this kind of work, but, 
you know, our, our, our key line is what is possible in circus? And that has led us to collaborate with symphonies, with, with operas, we have three operas next year, for example, um, with individual artists, with visual artists, you know, a whole range of people. And I think that brings a different way of thinking. And we've certainly, you know, when we play with bigger companies like Opera Australia or, you know, Opera de Lyon or um, uh, we're playing with the Luxembourg Philharmonic, there is always an exchange where we can teach something, you know, they, 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 you know, the conductor will come out and he'll be agitated because he has to listen to the sound of acrobats hitting the mats during his uh, performance, which is, you know, often... But in that space, there is always, you know, by the end of the collaboration, there is something learnt, there's some exchange. So I think we can all learn from each other in terms of what we're doing. Um, it's, I think it's interesting to just mention, and I'm not going to go on and on because I don't know that much, but it is interesting to mention that Yaron Lifshitz, who has been the founding, you know, the founder of Circa, um, which is a 20-year-old company now, um, is actually trained as a, a dramaturg and an opera director. And so he doesn't have a background in circus. I mean, obviously he does now, but in the way that we create shows, it's in, he creates shows, is very much a collaborative effort. It really starts with an idea, and he'll say to the acrobats, you know, okay, I want something here that's rich and high and this, and the acrobats will fill that space. So it's, it's quite a democratic way of working, and that filters down into other things that we do. Um, and, and, and just on the same sustainability note, because there's an elephant in the room, and we're an Australian circus internationally touring, um, we, of those sort of 25 to 28 acrobats, we'll split into three companies. Uh, we'll have a company that is based in Australia and touring Australian markets, We'll have a, a, a company here in Europe of, say, 10 acrobats and another company moving around within that. So we've just had the Edinburgh Fringe. We were there all month with a company of eight plus touring party. But we had a, a company of 10 playing in Zurich at the same time. And those companies will tend to stay offshore away from Australia for months at a time. We're not doing run-out tours. And, you know, that is a strain on the acrobats, but that's the way that we sort of try and manage this sustainability issue because Australian markets cannot sustain circa. <laughs> Um, I, I like that you referred also to humility. I, I, it resonates also from what Eric Le, Lenoir said, uh, this uh, need to be humble. But that said, um, when we look at uh, reconciling somehow our values and with our practices, um, there's a, a question I would like to, to, to ask all of you and feel free to jump in and to react to, to what the others will, will say. But it's really a question on uh, the articulation, um, how we can articulate this wish uh, for a more holistic approach to, to sustainability and its possible implementation So, in, in, uh, to take into account also our specific uh, context and specific values depending on where we are. And we know also that cooperation is not easy because it's exactly that, putting together people with different contexts and different values. Um, and um, my other question to that is like, uh, why does it matter, and who uh, does it matter to? It's not an easy one, but <laughs> whoever feels like jumping in. Yeah. I can jump in, because this uh, term holistic, it's very <laughs> maybe interesting, but what does it really mean? And um, we often also use it in, uh, for instance, in Perform Europe, and what we mean by it is uh, it's just the acknowledgement that the situation is very complicated. We talk about the artistic, cultural aspects, the economy, environment and yeah it's just the acknowledgement that everything is interrelated uh, uh, and we know that from daily practice huh? it's in the choices that we make uh, we're all very environmentally engaged and we want to uh, to be a uh, work uh, in an environmental friendly fashion but you need to ma uh, make a living you need to survive you need to make choices on a daily basis and uh, every invitation to go someplace it's always this balancing exercise am, am I, I going to grab this opportunity and what is the impact uh, what do i gain from it uh, and what is the negative impact on, on my life on uh, environment etc so we all know that uh, that these issues are interrelated because uh, it's the, the decisions that we make uh, on a daily basis. But this is only one level. Um, in Perform Europe, we saw it also on another level. Um, if you're making these decisions for yourself, it also really matters in which context uh, you are making these decisions. And we, we saw it quite clearly that uh, context really matters. Uh, for instance, uh, I live and I work in Brussels. 
I used to work for the Arts Institute there, and we created this map. It's called uh, Start to Train, and we made a map starting in Brussels and mapping all the places that you can go to uh, in six hours by train, and it's quite huge, in fact. So this, uh, there's a, a good situation to be environmentally friendly. But in Perform Europe, we had huge discussions with uh, people working in isolated uh, regions, in the Balkans, for instance, with less access to, uh, to this kind of uh, public transport, but also less access to connections within the international ecosystem, less access to funding. So, yeah, what's your priority when we talk to companies uh, from uh, this part of Europe? The environmental is very important, but in other contexts, it's no, it's really breaking out of this isolation. So it's very difficult to, uh, in this kind of international conversations, to uh, focus on just one aspect. Another example, you might have heard about it, a couple of years ago, the famous uh, French choreographer, Jérôme Bell, said that we should all stop flying. And there was, of course, uh, a huge repost by other artists. Uh, there was this Mexican company who wrote an open letter and said, Yes, it's because you can say that because you have been flying all your life. This is your privilege, and it's a kind of like a neo-colonial stance that you ask for us that we do not fly anymore. So it's, I think it's impossible to isolate the environmental aspect from, uh, from the idea of, uh, of social, social justice. So this is, uh, yeah, the acknowledgement that it's so complicated on a personal level, but also on a systemic level. So, yeah, this is the issue. Um, yeah. Theo, Theo, you wanted to yeah, add to that? Yeah, I want to say that um, I'm not, I'm, I don't really agree with the fact that complexity is an excuse not to make choices also. And sometimes you say, yeah, it's complex, so we don't know. At some point you have to make decisions. And I really like what Eric Lenoir said this morning about sometimes you say no. And uh, even if it's complex, you don't know, you say no. And us, for example, uh, many times real estate companies, they come to us, even a cement company, they come to us. A few weeks ago, the Rothschild uh, Foundation wrote to us, and to all these people, we say no. And we know it's tough. We are paid minimum wages in France. It's been 10 years we're doing this, so it's a huge commitment. And yes, yet we, we have to say no at some point. We have to stop uh, hiding from uh, this uh, complexity, and I don't know, and uh, I think it's not a post-colonial, uh, neo-colonialism uh, stance, it's about generation, and it's not uh, like, um, you don't take plain, I did, it's, uh, I mean, it, that's obvious, it's not about uh, being Mexican or French or whatever, it's uh, about also to a collective decision, so um, I think we should stop doing th some things. And even if it's hard, we have to stop and say no to clients, no to situations. And uh, for example, this is what we try to do. And it's not easy, of course. And it, it's maybe not sustainable as a practice to keep this thing. But uh, still, I think uh, I like what Eric Lenoir said. Just a brief reaction before I, uh, I don't want to take all the floor, <laughs> but uh, embracing and acknowledging uh, the complexity is one thing, but I completely agree that the only answer to that can be sharpness. You cannot tackle all these issues at the same time. That's not a thing. And saying no is very important, but also what you all said here, we had kind of like a very interesting spectrum of concrete experiments that tackle very specific things and uh, creating community in this place the deep mobility research, I think this is the way to go. Also your experiments with how can we uh, infuse new digital technologies in, in our economy. I think this is the sharpness that we really need in this complexity. Be very precise, set up experiments and learn from these experiments uh, together also with a kind of like an ethical standard, as you would say. So that's, uh, I think, a way forward out of uh, the complexity. Yeah, I was I was kind of freely associating uh, uh, a little bit, but uh, uh, in the sphere we have we tried to tackle the the concept of, of touring by um, by doing this this experiment we called it the mega vote actually. So it was we had uh, these uh, performances uh, that we transformed into digital commodities, basically almost in only crypto commodities. And we, we did a kind of fundraising where um, 
globally people that were already like into that uh, crypto scene. Let's say it's a weird, weird new audience that that uh, we can say bad and good things about. But they funded uh, one performance, and then all the stakeholders that we had collected it was 800. Um, uh, people from uh, Lithuania, Italy, uh, Germany, Sweden, um, etc. I'm saying in Portugal um, and so on. They, it was people that were audience, that were, were artists and so on. They could vote basically on which, which artists are going to make the next iteration of this performance. And what happens then is that it starts a new social, um, a new... Um, collaboration between the former artist and the new artist, and the new art artist is based somewhere else. The new artist is creating a work that it, it stems from another work, but it creates local uh, working opportunities, local presentations, and then also the former attraction get, spills over to the new work somehow. So it also gets, it finds a new kind of weird market where, where uh, it's, it's, it's not like instead of touring, but it's, it's actually adding value that also, of course, wants uh, that local place wants the original artists also come and perform. But then, alongside that one, this local artist can present their work, and and therefore it, it actually uh, creates um, it, it gives more um, more than just a production coming to a city presenting for an audience. It actually creates a, a local um, uh, economy community like. Uh, Thing. Uh, and, and I think this has been very fruitful because we see that, that these people who have done these derivative works or the original works have both benefited from this, this experiment as one way of maybe uh, adding some kind of sustainability note to like touring. At least we, we, you go there, and, but you also have a new context created and a new economy created around your work. Uh, a good input, but it doesn't work for everyone. It's not like in Circa should not cannot do that and not have 800 artists or 8,000 artists just being locally everywhere creating new performances that is copies of other performances. It, would, it wouldn't work, but uh, maybe you could find some way. We're actually exploring that right now. Um, no, but I think it's an interesting question, this touring thing. I mean, we've been touring out of Australia for, you know, 20 years, like obviously more locally originally, but now really more than ever. Out, we, we actually tour more than any other Australian performing arts company and that includes the large-scale companies like the opera, the ballet, the Sydney Dance Company. So we are out of there. Um, I think it's, you know, we've been thinking about sustainable touring uh, for a long time because obviously freight is incredibly expensive and slow. Um, so we really, uh, most shows, uh, we, have, we actually have mat storage all over the world. We have uh, local circuses store them for us and they can use them while we're not using them. And then we pick them up in the UK. We've had mats in LA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we try and share equipment where we can. Most of our shows are very low on apparatus, like mainly aerial, which can travel in, you know, in luggage. Um, and, you know, these kinds of considerations, costumes are lightweight, you know, all of that stuff. We use, you know, it's, um, it's been something that's been sort of, you know, programmed into circuit for a long time, which maybe some circuses are just thinking about now. Um, I think when we think about uh, sustainable touring, I mean, we all want longer seasons, you know. Ideally, Circa would be in one place for a month or two at a time, and that would be much better for the environment. Um, but that is incredibly hard to, you know, find venues at that scale that can do that. And, of course, there are artistic directors who want to change things up, have something different. Um, you know, one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have is, of course, we want to we want to tour sustainably. You know, we you know we'll, we'll speak to a presenter and say, okay, can you help us build a tour? You know, some places, you know, a local tour. Some places are much better than this than others. There's places like Canada where they've always had to rely on a network, otherwise they can't get artists, you know, to to their um, locales. Um, but you know. Time and time again, you get you come up against you know oh well we want to be the only ones in this region to show this show you know we we you know you can't have this anywhere else in whatever country um, and and this this has to change we can't you know we're we're doing our best we're you know happy to be flexible we we can scale shows up we can scale them down to fit into much smaller venues we've just created a, a sort of touring version of our main show Humans 2.0 which has no aerial and it's the same day open to facilitate smaller venues like dance venues that don't have the rigging and, you know, and, and or smaller venues that don't, can't give you a whole day to bump in. 
you know. So we're as adaptable as we can, but we can't, you know, I can't, we also, on top of that, you know, the repertoire is so massive. Like the company that's touring Humans 2.0 in Europe at the moment has five shows in repertoire and we could probably throw them into other shows. So if you have an artistic director that says, you can't do Humans 2.0 here, you know, it's got to be something. We can go to the next town and go, okay, we're going to do something else. But it's still, it's, it's still a huge barrier for us in terms of sustainable touring, you know, to say, okay, we'll line up a tour in, you know, in the Netherlands and it's like, okay, great, we've got a lot of interest, but there's no bump in, you know, we can only pay, you know, this much fees, you know, which, you know, it's, it's, it's this constant challenge. And I think that, again, coming back to the collaborative, we all, all parties in this, in this uh, ecology have to work together and probably communicate a bit better. Just a, a thought experiment for Circa, for instance. If, if Circa would change, change the business model to not having all of these, uh, these employees, not, not to just uh, create precarious uh, situations for all Australian circus performers, but for the sake of uh, what if the profit made from touring would go into a common, a common pool, basically, of, of, um, of cash. And then you could see how can we create a new Circa performance uh, decentralized, still has the quality that we want to label with, with Circa, but new artists from different areas around the world can actually participate in creating that, using um, that common pool. And then, if, if then uh, that performance starts, and then a certain percentage of that revenue from that would go to the common pool, new, new voting could happen, or so new, new decision-making could happen. And then, but how would you then... Uh, the interesting thing here is how can you keep quality and still open up to your whole, because you have such a big ecosystem of, of stakeholders, of, of audience all over the world and so on, they want to see your, so how can the brand itself uh, exist and still be qualitative, but you can invite uh, plural, plurality, it's impossible to say, but anyway, you do, you, you do that uh, through some kind of weird uh, business model. You would never do that, of course, but it would be, or I, I'm not going to say that, but it would be very interesting to see, would it survive? Would the brand survive and would you still um, stand behind the productions artistically and et cetera? Because it could change, uh, it could lessen the traveling by 80 percentage, whatever. Uh, it would be interesting. True. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting because I'm, my background is actually visual arts and so I've always worked in exhibition making, which is far worse than, than touring and, and circus, I can tell you that. The, the, the amount of waste is horrific. Um, but I think that, you know, it's interesting coming to the circus world and really learning more about circus is how distinct each style is. And we are distinctively Australian. And I think that's why people are interested in seeing us. And of course, you know, and distinctive with the artistic, you know, director, et cetera. So decentralizing, I mean, the French style is stunning. You know, it's no soft balls. It's very beautiful. It's very contemporary dance, you know. And that's a very different style than what we perform. So it would become like a monopoly. You're essentially, you know, it would become a brand that then, you know, you took over the world and everyone was just in Circa and Circa was Circus. And I don't think that's, that's good for anyone. You know, we've had discussions, particularly during COVID, I think everyone thought about this. Uh, the ensemble was actually uh, staying with our good friends here at Ariga um, because they were stranded for several weeks, is, you know, actually having a full circus that, you know, is, is here in Europe, for example. Like every time we go to, to London, which is fabulous, but it costs an absolute fortune for a presenter to put all of our acrobats in, you know, per diems, you know, accommodation, all of these things, flights. If you had a circa that was made up of acrobats from the UK, None of these fees would apply because they'd be in their hometown and they would be performing circus shows. But it becomes a different thing, right? We're, we're talking about a totally different beast. <laughs> I can I also, no solution to it. Yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> I'd like to add one more thing because in this table, interestingly, there is no programmer. I don't know why. But I think um, not only the triers and like um, the triers of the shifting uh, the structure of the artist company like Circa, but also the responsibilities and like responsibility of the programmer has been shifted as well. Because I think still the audiences has a right to see the good quality arts in the world. And um, to do that, artistic directors and programmers should be more careful, should working more to see and find the good reason of bringing these artists to their festivals and venues. And this is also linked to the sustainability, I think. And also, not only, okay, I like this show, I 
I'm sorry that I'm saying like this, but I like this year. I'm gonna bring this to my festival. But like, we need to be more careful. We need to be more, more sensible for for um, which show to be present, which narrative that we need to present. And like, um, maybe back to what Jerome Bell said, he is able to stop flying because he is Jerome Bell, and he's still working internationally with his network. But what if the emerging artists, what if the narrative that we need to deal with um, in the festival, in the venue, what if the, the, the marginalized people in the world, still we need to present more? Like, how can we make it more sustainable in a way? That's also my question. So, yeah, I think we can say no, but also before saying no, we also th we need to think about our responsibilities of what to present, what, who is in the room, as, as I said before. That's also, maybe we can talk about this as well. Yes, uh, I think it's a, it's a very good point. And you started to, to, to go into uh, more like these are ethical considerations. And I can also take an example uh, coming from the music sector and uh, relating to what you were saying about this uh, flying thing. We have more and more uh, festivals in France, at least, that start to say that they will not invite artists that are flying anymore. And if you think just about France, like we have uh, territories which are insular, uh, which are at the other side of the world, and those artists cannot come to uh, even central France without flying. So those considerations have, of course, to be, uh, to be taken into account. Uh, and not looking just at the transport modes, but really at uh, all the social and economical uh, issues. And I don't know if there's anyone from the European Commission here, but <laughs> uh, we also see now uh, the, there's a, um, a report that just came out about greening the Creative Europe uh, program. And with uh, a very, for me, problematic uh, definition of what green mobility is and really just focusing on the mode of uh, low carbon transportation but totally forgetting about uh, the rest. So that's also our, our point. Uh, so, um, because of course I have way more questions than <laughs> the time that we have, but I wanted to come also uh, to this question of the role of funders and uh, also linked to this uh, ethical. Um, and we see uh, sustainability issues that are often tackled separately or in, in silos. And uh, do you see maybe, or do you, do you have some examples, or do you see some um, uh, models that could uh, have a more, let's say, intersectional uh, approach to funding also, and trying to address those issues in a more, uh, again, holistic uh, way? <laughs> it, well, it doesn't have to be you uh, starting all the time, huh? <laughs> you know, but, um... Of course, in the research, we thought about these things. <laughs> so I have something ready. Uh, if you talk about the role of funders with regards to all these uh, complexities, I think there are two major points uh, to be made. First is uh, they need to uh, critically examine their own funding models and evaluate them and ask the question, in what ways are our current uh, funding system contributing to the problems, to the issues, uh, to the unsustainabilities, on the economic level, uh, environmental level, etc. In what way are we contributing, are the models contributing to this precarity that we are talking about? Uh, for instance, I'm not a big fan of, uh, of quantitative criteria, for instance, because it really stifles innovation, we have seen that. So critically re-examine the current funding models is one thing, but the other thing is also uh, reshape uh, the funding systems in order to really contribute to this uh, system change that we have been talking about. We've heard so much about these interesting experiments. It's a different kind of criteria. It's not uh, excellent artistic projects. It's really funding these projects that we think have a potential for development for our ecosystem in the future. And that's an interesting uh, way of looking. And if you look at uh, transition management literature, transition literature, transition science, it's always about the necessity of having these experiments. So I think uh, funding should also switch a bit more to this experimental research and development approach to make it possible. And also, uh, well, learn from these experiments. Uh, invest also in connections, networking between everyone 
here in the room also dealing with this. It's not only funders that need to do this, it's an important role also for the networks. Um, it's important to bring these experiments together, learn from that, and then ultimately mainstream these in uh, new funding systems. And I think that there are already good practices there. Just one example, uh, the, the, the Culture Moves Europe uh, mobility grants, who have been developing from uh, the opportunus uh, framework several iterations. Now the whole system with the, with the top-ups uh, for mobility adds a top-up, uh, more funding if you travel in an environmentally sustainable way. Add a top-up for accessibility purposes. Add a top-up if you want to bring your family. This is a very concrete, simple thing uh, integrated in a mainstream funding instrument tackling these diverse issues that we have been talking about. So I think uh, we already see uh, some things shifting that we are slowly learning from the experiments. But uh, yeah, these are some takes uh, that funders can take. Daniel? Yeah, just talking about the role of funding. I think, you know, um, we've had to be very creative about how we think about, you know, where money's coming from, especially when the whole world shut down. Um, so we had, we had every single show from literally, you know, the light globe that lit the table where the first idea came from for a production, all the way through to, you know, making costumes, build, you know, freight boxes, everything, all the way through to performing, and what the carbon footprint of every single production was. So we did that analysis, and we've got a lot of data there. But then what do you do with that? So, you know, ideally what we would like to do is something more than tree planting. I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of tree planting because it's, it's fraught, and it should really, you know, I think only be used to supplement all the other things you're doing. Um, but think of a way to monetize a carbon-neutral show. If you could say that we are actually a carbon-positive company and, you know, what we've done is not just offset, but we're doing all of these things, and then that be a product to sell and that, monetize, you know, become a, you know, an income stream, and then it feeds itself. But it's a lot harder to do <laughs> than just to propose. And we've looked at it so many different ways. And, you know, again, coming back to presenters, it's not always their preference or priority either. Um, so, you know, we're thinking about different ideas, but it, it, it's, it's very complex. Do you want to add on that? Also, yeah. maybe on the re regenerative even uh, there projects? There is the next that? slides just yeah. after. Because I think regarding to funders, um, there is something that we always talk about is also desires. Because if you look at this collapsing world, I think you don't want to change it. You want to stay in bed and watch Netflix all day. And uh, as Eric Lenoir said in the beginning of his keynote, uh, you start to feel depressed. And that is not a feeling that makes you change uh, things. So the one just before. This is a great uh, book of um, an art critic, uh, and uh, this is something that uh, we want to talk about, is that we need to give the people the desire to change things, and the changing things mean also to fight, and to fight uh, neoliberalism, to fight what is happening now. And um, this is also part of the work that we do. So the funders, uh, in our case, they come to us, they have a, a brief, something to, to do, like, for example, that we want a few tables down by the river, we have uh, 15,000. Then you have to work with them to create other desires, to, to twist this brief and to turn it into something else. Like, uh, for example, you want tables, but maybe we can do tables on a movie, and in the movie we talk about political subjects like uh, welcoming foreigners in the area and then you start to pull the strings of the project. And at the beginning, it was picnic tables. And then it became an entire world of discussions, arguments, controversies with the inhabitants and everything. So we had to make the funders and the clients desire for something else and to bring them to something else. Maybe there is other slides, but I don't want to... Yeah. yeah, that's all. Um, I won't talk about this. It's going to take too long. I think that's a really important point. I just want to jump in there and say, like, we need to be having a good time because it's pretty dark out there. I read The Guardian every week and I don't have a lot of hope. But I think, you know, when you walk into a really good show, 
it just transforms your experience and it can really lift you. So I think really importantly, keep making really good work. You know, don't squander the money that you have on making, you know, work that doesn't inspire, isn't exciting or surprising, you know. I think that's really core of what Circa does is to make something that shifts things. First, uh, a little side note just cons concerning Mark Fisher, because it, it's interesting, the artist Joshua Citarella, who's been like looking into the radicalization of young people on Instagram, uh, he has infiltrated this, this troll factory, basically, and, and, and uh, like infiltrated and created uh, Mark Fisher memes, post-capitalistic uh, memes coming from this kind of uh, nihilistic, uh, let's say, right-wing uh, accounts, radicalizing a youth towards post-capitalistic notions and ideas in a very interesting way. And I'm thinking this is an example of uh, something that fund, like the funding bodies can, can consider also, because we are getting um, too many productions, performances, and artists spending the work on doing pedagogical performances about climate change based on statistics or something. And this is not what the audience maybe needs to see, and it's not what the artists have to create. But the, but the way that a lot of applications and, and, and the funding ones are, are phrasing themselves is actually creating a, a, weird, um, a weird kind of art for the sake of getting money from the funding bodies. And, and here, we need to have clever infiltrators that can actually make artists also realize that you can you can apply for something and it can be climate positive perhaps or, or at least concerning be con considered with sustainability without talking about that or like because it can do something and then it can talk about something else and i think this is a total mess that i see in, in sweden at least that that there's so many uh, productions coming up talking about the issues straight forward like this is that what the artist intended originally, or is it something that has kind of uh, is lurking in the back of the head in order to be able to perform? Um. I chose to be the last one because I think my answer is like questionable. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, you asked me, you asked us about the role of the funder in a sustainable way. But I would say, like, um, so. For the last 14, 13 years of my practices, I've been working a lot with uh, Europeans and UK artists. Do you know the reason why? Because it was easy. Because it was easy to get the funding. It was easy to have a communication. And I, I think I chose something easy. And I realized that I don't really know. I'm saying it very honestly. I don't really know about Asia, in fact. And I, after I realized that I don't have like, enough information, knowledge about our neighborhood, I, um, tried, I tried to understand more and try to invest what I have, try to share what I have with other fellows in Asian countries. And um, what I would like to say is actually, Maybe we can also think about the role of the funder, for sure, that's important. But also, I would like to say that we don't, we, let's not make the funders to decide which way to go and try to find other spaces that we'd like to go, we need to go. That's, um, that's yeah, that's my answer. Sorry for this questionable <laughs> answer. Now let's see. Um, unfortunately, I've been way too optimistic, and now uh, we we have to to close the the discussion, so we will not take any questions. But uh, of course, you are welcome to come and uh, and ask questions to our speakers. We will have time during lunch and and this afternoon as well. Uh, thank you all for being uh, so uh, concentrated, and thank you a lot to the translators. I hope we didn't speak too fast. <laughs> Uh, and see you uh, in a bit. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's me again.
the practical information. Can I have your attention again? Lunch. Lunch is important, okay? We're gonna have lunch outside. It's not rainy. It's a bit cold, but it's fine. If you want to bring back the lunch inside, it's okay. So the lunch is now. What I suggest to you is that you walk and you go and grab your lunch at the end of the line because at the beginning is dessert, okay? So the main course is at the... And this yes, was so the third morning so sessions okay. of Fresh so on live with the streaming radio while the program of the afternoon is being listed for everybody. I, I want to, to thank you to listen to this very interesting morning that was here about sustainability. I want to remind you that soon there will be a podcast of this uh, streaming session. I want to remind you also that there will be a publication on these three days that uh, will be published by uh, uh, Sarah Abdou Bouchra, who was uh, there as a guest uh, editor of the future publication of Fresh. I want to remind you also that uh, you can find the podcast around Fresh that was produced by Mike Emus and also all other publications and resources in the link of uh, circostradas.org. I want to thank uh, Kinga Keshkesh, who was for us very, very uh, helpful person. Of course, Artsena was uh, driving all this uh, uh, project of uh, Circostrada. Here, everybody was fantastic, all technicians of La Villette, Le Plus Petit Cirque du Monde, and here, Village de Cirque, to help us to settle our small but necessary technical uh, computers and uh, mix uh, places. So I'm Aude Lavigne, French journalist. It is almost uh, time to go to it. It's uh, one o'clock, five minutes p.m. here in pelouse Recreuilly. Thank you to Clément, who recorded uh, all of all. Thank you to Bocard, too, who was there to help us making waves. is working with all around to make you listen to it. Thank you. And soon in, in the podcast, have a nice afternoon. Thank you all, Artsena Cecostrada and all the founders and partners to do this. And I have a bit of an information which is very important for the future, because you want to know where the next fresh will take place, right? Do you want to know? Okay, you're still alive. Okay, so, da 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 bam. So, Future Fresh, we're gonna have a fresh street in the UK in 2025. In June, which will be co-organized in Great Yarmouth together with Outdoor Arts, and we're very happy about that. Ipipura. And the next Fresh Circus uh, will take place in Sweden, in the cities of Botrka and Stockholm in February 2027, and it will be co-organized with Subtopia in collaboration with Riksteatern. Voilà, thank you, have fun. <laughs> <laughs>